Hello everyone, welcome to Radically Loved Radio. I wanted to create a place where people can go to to get inspired, get motivated, or find some clarity and get tools to create a radically loved life. I will do my best to provide information on a variety of subjects, including yoga, holistic health, life coaching, spirituality, meditation, and overall mindful living. Each episode will bring you some of the world's best spiritual leaders, entrepreneurs, yoga teachers, coaches, along with some of my closest friends, and we will talk about their life experiences and journeys to create something more out of their lives and how they continue to grow to make that happen. Hey guys, Rosie here. I just want to say I am so grateful that you're listening. We are just getting a massive amount of response on this podcast, and I am so grateful that you're a part of this radically loved community, that you're enjoying the content and that you're enjoying all the guests and that you're still here and you're still working on yourself and your journey and your path. And I pray that you've received some tools listening to the guests or listening to any of my ideas or topics on meditation or yoga and how these tools can help you create a life of purpose to continue to help us give you the best content, you can subscribe to this podcast. And most of the time you can just do it from your phone, from iTunes, click subscribe and write a review. This really helps us continue this path and this journey. And we love doing it so much. And again, I'm so grateful that you're here. Let us know what you thought. Thanks for listening. One cup of tea is all it's going to take to completely transform your perception of what premium tea should be. For those of you who are tea lovers like me, I'm so excited to announce my partnership with Rishi Tea for this amazing giveaway. Rishi Tea is going to give away an entire matcha essentials kit. All you have to do is go on Instagram, tag me, Rishi Tea, and the hashtag radically loved Rishi for your chance to win an entire matcha essentials tea set which those of you that know me know that this is like the ultimate gift so for those of you that are interested go on instagram now snap a picture of what your tea ritual looks like and get ready to experience the best tea you've ever tried in your life Rishi tea is my ultimate favorite i cannot wait to share this experience with you um, so I wanted to have you on just to have a conversation with you about uh, several different topics. Um, and mostly I'm just really excited to have the opportunity and the privilege to talk to you. So thank you for being on the show. Oh, good. My pleasure, Rosie. And um, for the, pe- the listeners that are listening uh, now, if you could just give the audience just a really brief uh, background on on you and and what you do and who you are. Yes. Well, I've been a psychologist now for more than half my life, I guess. Um, I got my doctorate at Stanford in counseling psychology in 1974. And I was very interested um, in finding what the key essential things are that help people change. Mm -hmm. And so I was very um, focused on that in my research at Stanford and in my clinical work. And when I finished there, I decided to uh, take a professor job at the University of Colorado teaching graduate students in the field of counseling psychology. And so I continued to do that um, up until 1995. All along this time, my wife, Kathleen, uh, also known as Katie, and I uh, were doing something that um, not a lot of people do, which we were working together as well as being together in our marriage. And so we were 24 hours a day in the same container of what we were both most interested in. And so we began... um, we began offering relationship seminars first for small groups of people. And then at one point in the late 1980s, uh, we decided to write the book Conscious Loving. And that was our first book that I always say, we went from working with six couples in our living room to uh, working with uh, 10 million people on Oprah a few days later. (laughs) 
<laughs> and so when conscious loving came out, our lives really changed radically, particularly after we were on Oprah a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, we were both um, in private practice and university professors at the time. And suddenly we, uh, you know, were traveling all over the place doing seminars and speeches and being on talk shows and that kind of thing. So I gradually decided to let go of my professor job. And for the last 20 some years, um, we've had the Hendricks Institute, uh, our own institute, and we train several hundred coaches and therapists and medical professionals every year in our training programs. Continue to write books. Um, uh, you, I think you were going, you were asking about my book, um, The Big Leap. Mm -hmm. uh, that one came out in 2008 and has kind of been adopted as the Bible of the coaching movement. Mm -hmm. And I'm very grateful about that because each year the book has been out, it's sold more copies than the year before. So it's kind of made me a hero to my publisher. And so I, <laughs> I very much appreciate all the coaches and professionals out there who have adopted the big leap. It's, uh, it's very gratifying for an author to see a book like that, that uh, people really use, you know, one of the best things, one of the best compliments I ever get is when somebody comes up to me on the street and says something, you know, like, I read Conscious Loving, and it really changed my marriage. And so I get to hear things like that all the time, but I never get tired of it. So uh, it's very gratifying. Well, just going on to just, you know, on, on the on the coattails of The Big Leap, uh, I've purchased 57 copies of it, uh, and I've given them all away, just, uh, just uh, uh, as a little reference, because it really is the Bible of just self-development and and living with purpose and and finding your purpose and knowing what your limits are and working through all of our obstacles i mean it really is an incredible book um and i even still now listen to it um on on audio uh i have it on audiobooks on my phone and when i'm on the airplane or if I'm traveling or if I'm in the car somewhere, I'll just throw it on and, and listen to it. It's just such a great, what was your process in writing that book in particular? Well, I, I started thinking about it. Well, just for people who haven't read the book, oh, right. there's two big ideas in it. One is the idea of the upper limit problem, which is something that I identified first on myself and then began to look for it in, in couples and individuals too it's the tendency to sabotage ourselves when things start going better mm -hmm. and i call it the upper limit problem because it's kind of like bumping up a up against a glass ceiling over and over again and a lot of people just think maybe they're doomed or cursed or, or bad luck or something like that but you can change your luck very quickly because the upper limit problem is really based on some underlying fears that once you come to terms with those fears, then you won't keep bumping your head up against um, the um, the glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. So there's two there's two big ideas. One is the upper limit problem, and the second one is what I call the zone of genius. And what I've discovered in working with close to twenty thousand people now, individuals, and about forty five hundred couples over the years, is that no matter who you are, you have a zone of genius in you that once you tap into that, it makes your success come to life in a whole new way, but almost as important or maybe more important than your success, once you open up to your zone of genius, you live in a constant state of increasing satisfaction and joy because you're always uncovering more of your z zone of genius. And so once you start that process, it becomes a positive addiction. You want to be more in your zone of genius. And so the big leap shows you how to recognize and get into your zone of genius and gives you tools for staying there. Wow. That and, and it's such a powerful thing. Can you just give us a little bit of insight as to how we begin to find that zone of genius or what are the first couple of steps that we begin to take to find that? Yes, the most important question to ask yourself 
the most important question to ask yourself to zone in on your zone of genius is, what do I most love to do? What is it that with all my heart, I most love to do? And that question has opened up the door to genius to more people. People, I see it when they come to our seminars. Mm -hmm. I see one moment when they don't understand their zone of genius. And then the moment they click into it and the look on their face is incredible. It's like a light comes on in them. So if you think back, um, and even you can do this right now, Rosie, is if you think about the work you do, mm -hmm. what is it that is the thing you most love about it? Mm. Well, I personally love connection and uh, just being present with somebody. Like I just, I love being able to connect with my students or when I'm teaching yoga or when I'm, you know, working with a client, I, I love the connection and, and that moment when you're just, you're fully present with someone and, and you feel the other person's presence as well. It's, it's like you're consumed by a moment. And for me, that's, that's what I love the most about doing this is, is the ability to be able to experience that. Yes. So and I bet if you look back through your life, you can see times and moments where you had that kind of connection early on, and it set a template for you for the rest of your life. Mm. Yeah, I think that, you know, I the way I, I grew up in uh, in East Los Angeles, where it was during a time where it was chaotic and uh, tumultuous, and there was just a, a lot of trauma. <laughs> so for me to have those moments uh, that you know I experienced with with each of my parents and uh, my grandmother or my family, because we there was always a lot of love, right? And to me, being able to connect with the the people that I really cared about always made everything better. It always just made me feel better, you know? Yes. Yes. And, well, you're in a line of work also that really that sense of connection and that being with and being present with, that's really the gift that's at the center of yoga, mm -hmm. mm. I think. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. And or any good, you know, body-centered type transformation it's that connection. Yeah. I, I had a very interesting experience when I was, I think I was in my late 20s. I met a man named Jack Downing, who was actually a psychiatrist, but he didn't really practice psychiatry. He did rolfing and he, you know, did other kinds of unusual yeah. forms of therapy. Um, but I worked with him for a while and he said something really to me once that changed my life. It was so different from anything anybody had ever said to me. At the time, the field of dance movement therapy was just growing, but I'd never really heard about it. And one of the hotbeds of it was there in that Palo Alto area where I was going to Stanford at the time. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but I'd never heard of dance movement therapy. I was a very heady you know, kind of behavior modification type psychologist. And, and so <laughs> I, uh, I didn't know about all this body stuff, but right. Jack, Jack had talked me into getting roughed. And so that was really making me feel a lot better. And so one day he said, you know, one good way to solve problems in your life, I was talking to him about some problem I was having with my girlfriend at the time. Mm -hmm. And he said, one of the ways you solve a problem is you could talk about it in therapy, but a whole other way is you could put on some music and move around to it and kind of let that open up the problem for you. And I said, wow, that's very weird. I never heard of such a thing. And, and I said, uh, that really wouldn't work for me because I can't dance. And so I'd always sort of thought of myself as somebody who couldn't dance. And so you never saw me out on a dance floor. And so Jack said, no, no, don't worry about dancing. He said, just put on some music 
and sort of begin to move your body back and forth to the beat of the music. <laughs> Which is what dancing is, right? It's like but the I, definition I, of dancing. <laughs> and, but he said, don't dance, you know, just move your body to the music. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I went home, and I'll tell you what year it was. It was when the Pink Floyd album, Dark Side of the Moon, was brand new, and oh, I just wow. bought that album. And so I think it was 1971, maybe, uh, probably a very many years before you were born. <laughs> um, so anyway, I turn on this loud music and um, got there and I started, I tried to find the beat. And it was, it was really like watching Frankenstein learn to dance, I think. You know, it was kind of like I was oh, lurching no. back and forth trying to find the beat. But finally, it kind of clicked in and I began to be able to move with the beat and I began to focus in on that issue that I'd been talking to Jack about. And sure enough, within about 10 minutes, suddenly I saw the, what I needed to do and which involved breaking up with that girlfriend, you know, I didn't have my heart in it anymore. Right. And so I just hadn't been willing to admit that to myself, but suddenly within 10 minutes of dance and movement with it, uh, I had the answer. And then, amazingly enough, I discovered that there were several, uh, a, a girl that I was also interested in uh, was in a dance therapy group and invited me to it one time. And I went to it and I was just totally blown away by how powerful body centered things helped you move through issues. And so, I became kind of a body zealot in the sense that I began to work a lot with people's breathing. And mm -hmm. I never got into doing hands-on stuff like rolfing or anything like that. But I, I use people's bodies all the time in the sense of I help them like with the upper limit problem. I help them identify the fears that are underneath the upper limit problem. For example, a lot of people, like I talk about in The Big Leap, mm -hmm. A lot of people have a fear of outshining other people, and so they keep themselves kind of hidden inside or they don't develop their full talents because they fear that if they did, they would outshine or outdo other people. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people artificially limit themselves like that. Another big problem that I work with people all the time on, even quite well-known people, is that a lot of people, no matter how famous or successful they get, still have a feeling deep inside of somehow being unworthy or unlovable. Mm. I have another book called Learning to Love Yourself uh, that probably also with The Big Leap and Conscious Loving are the, the three books I'm most proud of in my life. Conscious Living, too. Um, but um, I really... Um, I. You know, the ideas in the big leap and and conscious loving and learning to love yourself are, for me, so central to what has changed my life. And I get to see them all the time as they change other people's lives. And so I'm really, um, you know, to this day, even though I don't teach as many seminars, my wife still teaches our seminars, uh, but I kind of stay home and write the books. Even to this day, though, as you can probably hear in the tone of my voice, these ideas excite me just as mm -hmm. much as they did 50 <laughs> years ago when I began to discover them. Well, I think that that's, that's key, right? I mean, that's, that's part of, you know, n knowing what your zone of genius is, <laughs> isn't it? You know, to be able to get excited and, and passionate about the things that you love to do or that the that you love to teach or that you love to learn about. I think that that's key. You know, we have to look at sage teachers like yourself to, to see, you know, to light the way for us, you know, as we continue to learn and find those things out and discover what more of our upper limits are. So I have a question about the upper limits. I'm not to deviate, but can, is it just, do you think that ultimately we just have one one encompassing higher limit or, or upper limit problem or do you think that they're they change over time oh i think they change over time but often if you look down inside you'll find that there is one theme that keeps showing up mm. um 
like uh, I mentioned a few moments ago, this idea of out outshining. Mm-hmm. I've had so many people I've worked with that they identify oftentimes relationships with brothers and sisters when they were a kid where maybe there was three or four kids and one of them was kind of the golden boy or the golden girl and my client wasn't that person. And so they were almost given an under handed message not to outshine the golden boy or the golden girl. Mm -hmm. And so they they tend to stay shy and in the background. And one of the most satisfying things that I've ever experienced in my life is when someone like that suddenly steps out from behind their shyness and steps out in front of people to really show who they really are deep inside. That's to me something that um, I, it warms my heart so much because I think we need to acknowledge that on this planet of ours, many people are in pain because they are not expressing their full potential. And I've been around the world 30 some times now in my career and everywhere I touch down, whether it's in Chicago or Calcutta or Kalamazoo, it really doesn't matter. People are struggling with the same issues inside. Inside, they're struggling with, how can I make the most of myself? How can I bring forth the best of myself? And in relationships, they're struggling with questions like, can I be myself? Do I have to have a secret self in order to be in a marriage or in a relationship? Um, you know, the, those central questions that always keep coming up in relationships are to me some of the most important aspects of living for us to master. For example, in relationship, if you can't master the issue of blame and criticism, you'll always be unhappy in your relationships. You'll either be drawing blame and criticism to you, or you'll be putting out blame and criticism, or you'll be in a relationship where it has a lot of recycling blame and criticism back and forth. Mm -hmm. And so I see people all the time wasting their creative time and potential engaging in these repetitive dramas when what really needs to happen, whether you're in a relationship or not, is to go down inside and really find your zone of genius so that you're bringing your true real self to the world and letting that shine. How do you think that is happening now in the age of digital media when people in relationships now are utilizing mediums like Tinder or OkCupid or Match.com and they're doing most of this dating online where you don't actually get to see the person in in real life and there's so much more room for the facade of of what we're trying to show forward. How do you think that that plays now in in our current state of the world? Yes, well, I think that it's it's a sets up a special set of barriers in what I call the eternal quest for authenticity. Mm-hmm. That no matter where you are and who you are and what kind of devices you have, you've got to be on a quest for finding your true self, who you truly are. And so any time you spend in the world of facade cuts down the time you're able to discover who you really are. So I think, you know, I'm very positive on technology in general. I think it's a really a great thing because like, for example, um, the company that markets my um, relationship e-courses, they advertise widely on places like Match.com and Mm -hmm. OkCupid and and things like that because people are, are seeking to improve their lives in the area of relationships. And relationships are partly about the vibrational connection between two people, but it's also very practically about a whole bunch of skills that you need to master. Like in relationship, you need to learn how to express the truth about what you're feeling. Mm-hmm. Um to be able to say I'm angry or I'm sad or I'm scared or whatever the communication is. If you're unable to say things like that, 
that really compromises your ability to experience any kind of flow in your relationships. Same thing with blame and criticism. Nobody ever blamed and criticized their way to a great relationship. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, uh, you know, in politics, nobody ever blamed and criticized their way to a great country. Uh, And so I'd I'd like the politicians to learn this lesson pretty quickly, too. Um, (laughs) So, um, you know, Katie and I decided to go on a blame and criticism diet 30 some years ago. And it took us many years to do it, but golly, once we mastered it, neither one of us have said a critical word to the other in 15 or 20 years. Oh my goodness, but that's so that's so challenging. How are you supposed to do that, Gay? Okay, I've been in a relationship for 14 years, and I... I just, I am, I, I don't know if I could do that. It's very, very challenging. I think. Uh, well, have you ever fasted for a day? <laughs> yes, I have actually. Well, just fast from blaming and criticism. It's exactly <laughs> the same thing. Rather than putting, not putting something in your mouth, don't let something come out your mouth. I think it's, I think it's easier for me to do a fast than it would <laughs> to not let anything out. <laughs> I wonder if they're interchangeable. Um, yeah, that. Why is it? I mean, I think it's obviously you speak to this, but it's it's quite challenging, isn't it, to to be able to do this? It's a practice, you know. Yes, and it, it's definitely, but but the payoff is so immense that I think that's what really people are afraid of. Mm-hmm. Why they don't do it more is if you eliminate blame and criticism. You need to take responsibility for what you're creating in reality in any given moment. And once you decide you're going to take responsibility for what you're creating rather than assuming you're the victim of other people, Mm -hmm. that opens you up to a power, a creative power that is simply awesome. And I live in that power every day, and it's the best, most wonderful feeling is to know that there is nobody to blame, nobody to criticize. The only person that's responsible for my state of well-being is me. And that's the most powerful position to be in because it hooks you up directly to the creative source of energy in the universe. Mm -hmm. And so I highly recommend that as quickly as possible, people really um, taste the incredible power of taking responsibility rather than blaming other people. Yeah, I, I, wow, it's it's very powerful. I can just even feel the the power of that. Just thinking about how good that would feel to be able to tune into that frequency or be in that state. Well, good. Well, tomorrow start simply with uh, <laughs> do it an hour at a time. Don't even try a day at a time. Okay, I'm gonna try it. And I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna try it, and and I'm gonna report back and and let you know how it goes. What do you think the difference? is between settling and compromise, or is there a difference? Well, I, I don't recommend settling for less, certainly. I, I, in fact, I almost never recommend, recommend compromise, because compromise usually means for many people that they have to give up what they really want. Mm they have to shave themselves off a little bit. They have to take a few inches off their height to compromise instead of being their full self. So what I like to say is, let let me give you an example. I worked with a family, Katie and I, and it was a mother and a father and three kids. And they fought about lots of things, but one thing they fought about all the time was they would go out to eat Uh, once a week at a restaurant and which restaurant they went out to would be a subject of many arguments that would start on about Wednesday and then come to peak on Friday night. Okay. So (laughs) it was a big theme of their lives enough to get them into therapy. Okay. Yeah. So, so picture the situation, mother, father, three kids, they're fighting all the time about where to go out for dinner on Friday night. So when they came in for therapy, Guess what the solution they'd come up with was? You would never guess it in a million years. 
the only solution they could come up with was to go out to a restaurant where nobody wanted to eat at. <laughs> and what happened? <laughs> <laughs> well, the therapy took about three hours, three weeks, okay? And so I had them do the most bizarre thing the following Friday night. I had them each simply write down on a piece of paper, secret piece of paper, what the restaurant was they most wanted to eat at and to put it in a box, okay? So it's a drawing. Okay. And so on Friday night, everybody drew, and the game was they got to go to each of the restaurants. In other words, they would visit each of the restaurants sequentially and get something at each restaurant. Mm. And so, as a matter of fact, they didn't have to go to five restaurants because a couple of the kids had picked the same restaurant. And so they ended up, I think, only having to go to three or four restaurants. But they started at six o'clock and they had one thing, you know, uh, let's say Johnny got his favorite thing and the rest of them got an appetizer. And then at the next restaurant, Janie got her favorite thing and everybody got something else. And so by the end of the evening and got dessert, everybody was totally stuffed. <laughs> but, uh, but they were also singularly rewarded by getting exactly what they wanted to get. And so they only had to do that once or twice before it kind of broke through the whole pattern of, of arguing about it. And then it just became, you know, somebody would say, hey, let's go to chow chow this week and a person say okay and um, then a couple of times they would do things like they would go to one restaurant a Chinese restaurant for the first course and then they would go to an Italian restaurant or a Thai restaurant for the next one and uh, like that but it it speaks if you think of that as a, a metaphor for how we do life the idea is to get out of the energy of the negative fighting all the time and put that energy purely into what do you really want and how can I make that happen in a creative way? And so that's um, an example of how, how you solve any problem, really. Like if you find yourself worrying about something, which many of us do, mm -hmm. instead of doing that, simply think about what it is you want to create. So any worry thought is a signal to, that you can also call upon your creativity to figure out what you most want to do. So the art of turning negative thoughts into positive thoughts is one of the key skills that I think all of us should learn when we're in the first grade. Mm. Yeah, and how do we learn that? Yeah, well, I've seen some schools that are doing a pretty good job of teaching that, but they're pretty rare. Uh, Gay, I have a question from one of our listeners who wants to know, uh, this is regarding uh, The Big Leap, which she read, uh, and she's asking, if I have never felt like I have a special skill, how can I go about finding it? If I have never had the feeling of contributing, how do I find that? Yes. For, well, first of all, let's turn that into the most positive question that doesn't even reference the past. So a question would be, what do you need or want to learn right now that you feel would help you discover more of your zone of genius? Mm -hmm. So usually when we're stuck on a certain question, we need to increase the vibrational quality of the question itself. As E.E. E. Cummings, the poet, once said, in one of his poems, it's always the beautiful question that gets the beautiful answer. And so to ask the highest quality question, which is, what do I need to do this moment, this day, this hour to open up more to my zone of genius? Forget what I've believed about myself in the past. Forget that I don't think I've contributed. Forget all that. That's just past. Everything brings you to this moment. 
This moment is the only thing that matters. And in this moment, the best question you can ask yourself is, what is my zone of genius? What am I most here to do? What is it that I most love to do? What is it that when I contribute, it brings me the most satisfaction? And so those questions to me are sacred questions. I've help people ask them all over the world. I ask them every day myself. Um, I've been asking them now for the past 35 or 40 years, and they've led me to a life of incredible joy and contribution. And so I want everybody else to get into that game too. And there's no better way than to just starting right now and finding what is it that I most need to love in myself? What is it that I most love? What really is my true zone of genius. Mm, That's beautiful. Okay, thank you so, so much. That's so amazing. Uh, One of the final questions that I ask all of my guests is, uh, it's about Radically Loved. I created this forum as a place for people to come to, to get information, to get inspired, and to feel supported. And Radically Loved is this idea that we are radically loved by God, source, universe, whatever higher power of your understanding. So, final question to you is, how do you feel radically loved? And what do you radically love? Oh, what a beautiful question. I feel radically loved, by the way, thanks to my uh, high school Latin teacher, Miss Emma Williams, I happen to know that the root of the word radical is in Latin, radix or radix, sometimes pronounced, it means root or core. And so I feel loved at the core because I opened up on a given day 40 years ago and loved myself for the first time. And so I feel radically loved by myself. And out of that radical love, I manifested a relationship with the most loving human being i would ever conceived of meeting on this planet. And so I've had 38 years of living in a radical love experiment of how much love and joy and positive energy and how much contribution could we make. And so in our lives, we've gone all the way from um, being very poor when we started uh, to great contribution and written many books and been around the world and created wealth and all of the good things that you can do on this planet. But they all really come out of a deep inquiry into What is it that I'm here to do? What is it that I most love to do? And how can I best contribute to other people? Mm, Thank you so much. Wow, that that is probably one of the best answers I've ever heard on this show. (laughs) Thank you so (laughs) thank you so much. That was so beautiful. For the people listening that want to know more, where can they connect with you? Our main website is Hendrix.com spelled H-E-N-D-R-I-C-K-S dot com, Hendricks dot com. Um, we have a nonprofit foundation, the Foundation for Conscious Living, also, uh, that people can go to that website, foundationforconsciousliving.com. And um, they um, also um, can usually find our books around. My wife and I have co-authored a dozen books together, and then I've written some of my own, like uh, The Big Leap and Learning to Love Yourself. So those are widely available. And um, we also do seminars around the world. My wife is up in Berkeley this weekend teaching one, and then she's going off on a European tour May 7th to do them in uh, London and Munich and places like that. And so she's on the road doing a lot of things like that. And I uh, kind of stay home and feed the cats and write books. (laughs) So great. Gay Hendricks, everyone, thank you so much for being a guest. Give Katie and Greta and Alice my love. Thank you so much for being on the show. I appreciate you and everything that you do, that you continue to teach. And uh, you're a huge inspiration to me. And I thank you. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom, from the core of my being and my heart. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Many blessings to you on your work. Thank you. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I am so excited to continue to do this. Please share this with your friends. Email us, message us on Instagram at Rosie Acosta or on Twitter at Rosie Acosta. Subscribe on iTunes, write a review. We love doing this, so please help us continue to keep this podcast going. Thanks for listening.